All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and for the, we're, we're, we're streaming live tonight also. We're doing the best to do that. So I'm Sean from Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy. And thank you guys all for coming out. Um, my wonderful wife, Janet, we're both pharmacists. And we have, oh, let's see, 1998. So we're going on 24 years now, 25 years now, this fall, that we would, we've been um, compounding hormones for, for patients. And Janet and I, as we go along further, uh, ourselves in life and our patients um, grow with us, we've really started to focus more on that. And that's like 95% of our practice. Um, hormones have changed our lives, our patients' lives. And one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons we like it and have a passion for it is because we have seen so many people it helps. Just a little background on us. We are true pharmacists that do not believe in drugs to treat long-term disease. Seriously, when it comes to diabetes, when it comes to reflux, when it comes to high cholesterol, we don't buy it at all. I mean, we, we really don't. And it's very powerful for two pharmacists to, to um, say that. Now, when you look at a lot of the diseases we treat today, um, many of them are hormone related, uh, whether it be osteoporosis, um, osteoporosis, which is one of the most debilitating diseases in women. All the commercially available pharmaceuticals that are on the market are indicated for postmenopausal women. Okay, well, what do postmenopausal women lack? They don't lack Fosamax, right? I mean, they lack hormones, right? So it, it's crazy how we have really taken a drug industry and treat symptoms. Osteoporosis is a symptom of an underlying problem, hormone imbalance. So let's fix the problem and not treat the symptoms. And that's really what, what we believe in at our pharmacy. And we absolutely love what we do. Um, Licenses in multiple states all around the nation, and we ship prescriptions all over the nation. And um, we talk hormones to um, healthcare professionals and patients all day long. Absolutely love it because it it really changes lives. Um, when we look at some of the disease states that we have that we treat chronically in this country, let's talk about depression. And how often do we see it? When and Jen and I almost roll our eyes now when we get a question. It's about, well, I've got a 45-year-old, and she just recently is depressed. And so we put her on Prozac, just name one, SSRI. It's like, you know, and, and her cycle started becoming more irregular. It's like, this is hormones. This is not a Prozac deficiency, all right? Let's fix it with hormones. So that's exactly what Jan and I do. Um, and, and we are welcome to answer any questions. We have some cards up here. One of the things that the card has on it is a QR code, which those things are popular now, um, and it takes you to our YouTube site, which our YouTube site is has over 1,500 educational videos, many of them on hormones. But we also realize that hormones are just a piece of the puzzle. Um, we, we believe in diet, we believe in exercise, we believe in sleep. Those are three of the things that really make us healthy or not, and hormones are a piece of that puzzle. So you know, scan that QR code, go to our YouTube site, um, we also have a bi-weekly podcast where we interview healthcare professionals and um, all kinds of health coaches and patients um, from all over the world, um, and a lot of them are on hormones. And just medical freedom also. We believe in medical freedom, and I think hormones are part of that. Um, health is definitely part of that. I mean, if you want to be liberated um, overall, I mean, you've got to have a healthy lifestyle. You've got to be healthy. Um, you want to be liberated from the system. You want to be liberated from pharmaceuticals. You want to be liberated that uh, the healthcare system doesn't control you. Um, we have those choices. The best health insurance we have is not some kind of policy that we can buy. It's right here. It's how we take care of ourselves. I actually wrote a book about that. It's called Sicken, How the Government Ruined Healthcare. I have a few copies here if you'd like some. And uh, I'm going to give it to Janet. So if you have any um, questions, please feel free to ask us during the session. We're not having any kind of formal presentation, but... My beautiful wife, Janet. <laughs> so, Sean and I met actually um, when he was finishing up college, so I was his boss. And she's still my boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up very rural in um, North Dakota, and my parents were um, ranchers, and, and so, you know, we kind of have this attitude of working hard, and I think going into business uh, is like that. And for Several years, Sean and I worked um, in traditional setting, settings, so we um, dispensed a lot of medications. And the problem that we started having is that our patients were going out the door with more and more medication. It wasn't getting less; it was more. And it kind of kind of hit you a little bit because it's like, are we really helping them? Right? 
And it wasn't until one of my clients that I served from probably the time I moved to the city we live in in Moses Lake until the time she passed. She was 50 years old. And Patty called me up on the phone and she said, I want to thank you. I love you. I appreciate all the services and things that you have done for me. And while we were going through this conversation, my mind kept reflecting on what I had done for Patty. And I started questioning all the things that I had done. I was sending out her bags of medication every month. And her illnesses were just getting more and worse and worse and worse. She died at 50 years old of morbid obesity and organ failure. And she was a beautiful woman. I loved her to death. I enjoyed interactions and, and getting to know her. But what that forced me to do was to recognize that perhaps my path of helping patients needed look in the mirror and think that I really helped Patty. I feel like I got part of the grade. And part of the system of healthcare has been in the last 30 years, because that's about how long I've been practicing, is that we're spending less time with our clients and giving them less answers on how to take care of themselves. And so um, I don't believe anything that's in a pill form is going to solve all your problems your problems or your illnesses or improve your health. There's many things that we have to do along the way that are going to help and assist you, but coming from a pharmacist, I don't believe the pharmaceutical industry is really doing us all a big favor. I think we're, we're digging graves is really what I believe. So Sean and I decided that we either get out of healthcare or we do something totally different. And so we chose a different path and um, from a mother and a wife, it's made a huge difference in the health of our children. We have two young boys that are extremely healthy and fit. Young boys are 20 yep. and 22 now. <laughs> right? They are young to us. Uh, but, but my point is, is, is our youngest was overweight. He had a weight issue. My husband and I both have battled weight. Our oldest never, I think, he's the endless eater yeah. still could use a little bit more. But it's changed our trajectory too for ourselves because we want to believe what we preach and, and share with others. And so we'd like to partner with other healthcare providers that actually help people get off their medication and solve the problem that they are living with. Because most of the things are very lifestyle oriented. They're, they're decisions that we make day in and day out and they're not hard. They're just something that we have to implement. And I think if we didn't look for everybody else to solve our problems, but actually look then with partnering with healthcare providers that we could achieve that goal. And that's what we've been doing. And I can't tell you how many lives I have enjoyed watching and watching their journey as whether it's one person in the family and then there's somebody else or the person that comes in and says, hey, I just got off my cholesterol medication. I'm no longer taking statins and I feel wonderful. I mean. Those little things really encourage me, and so I hope you learn a lot from Mr. Lambert and from Melinda. So I'm going to turn it over to Carl Lambert from the book books. Okay, okay, great. So nice to be here. I'm not used to a camera, but these guys said just act normal, so I'm acting normal. <laughs> I have to tell myself that first. So it's actually great to be here, and so I'm the medical director and nurse practitioner from Pacific Northwest Wellness, and now I'm helping with you guys here in Sandpoint. Now what's interesting is I actually have family here now, well, family to be, so my nephew is going to be marrying her daughter. Yeah, and so it's a small world. I'm going to come all the way to Sandpoint to have family. Wow, okay. That just means you need to be there. I think so, I think so. so let me just start, I'll give you my history of going from starting out in you know, allopathic medicine and uh, starting, actually I have another colleague, previous colleague from Confluence Health uh, back in Wenatchee. So I used to work with her in urgent care and that's how I started, urgent care, family practice. And uh, we would see 20, we could see 30, we could see 40 patients in that 12 hour shift and it was giving them a pill for every ill. And it was exhausting, if you recall those days. 
Um, and it was to the point where it's like, no, something has to change, something has to shift. So back in 2006, I jumped out of that pill for every ill machine, and it was it was life changing. I mean, it was a huge paradigm shift, and I stepped out 2006, and then probably in 2013 had a huge paradigm shift when I went to this conference in D.C. and learned. There's all kinds of ways to prevent heart attacks and strokes. And then thanks to my colleague, Dr. Hoey, who has since passed, um, but he shifted me into the paradigm of hormones. And that was another paradigm shift for me in 2015. And the more I grasped the hold of the importance of hormones, and it's so funny because uh, to this day, you know, I still hear from peers at these big systems saying, oh, you know, if you want alternative medicine, go see Carl. I'm going, hold on, uh, I've got, you know, the whole list of articles that I could give them to. But these are from medical journals, peer review medical journals on the benefits of estrogen, the benefits of testosterone, the benefits of optimizing thyroid. So it's not from foo-foo alternative medicine. I mean, again, the list just goes on. It's just that we've lost our way in this big pharmacy owned and operated nation where we're going to give you well, let's say statins we're going to give you statins for cholesterol you guys heard of statins before okay statins used to be i think they were the number one selling drug they've been probably bumped down to number two slightly um, so statins let's just use that as an example um, the absolute uh, i'll try and just you know give you some numbers and try and explain it in layman's terms as best as possible. There's relative risk reduction. There's absolute risk reduction. Uh, have you guys ever heard of those terms before? So the relative risk reduction is a number most of us should never hear about. It's the absolute risk reduction. So meaning if your doctor wants to put you on a statin, you say, well, tell me what that absolute risk reduction number is. So that number for statins, for all statins, happens to be 2 to 3%. So what that means is we have to treat 100 patients in order to benefit maybe 2 to 3% from having a heart attack or stroke. But then you got to have to ask the question, okay, what are the side effects? Because if you want informed consent, and that's really important on all medications, you want to know, okay, doc, what's the side effect? Tell me about those. And if they're honest, you know, they'll tell you, well, you need know, potential for muscle aches, potential for dementia, erectile dysfunction. Over the lifetime of being on statins, uh, the increased risk of diabetes is over 360%. So that's an important number to, number to know. For females, it does increase the risk of breast cancer by 25 to 30%. So these are important side effects to know. So you have to know the risk versus the benefit. But I can tell you stories. Uh, there's a recent story of one of my patients came to me about two or three months ago and said, hey, you know, I was just over the big system and this brand new doc said there's this great drug that's going to prevent you from having a heart attack. And I was like, oh, well, you know, tell me what, what it is. I'd love to know. Lipitor. Oh, that's a statin. Yeah. I, you know, he said it was you know, great, so I should be on it. So I said, okay, let's take a look at uh, your cholesterol numbers. Let's figure out what was, what was happening when you went in to see him. And I think his total cholesterol is like 170, and his HDL, that's high density, that's the good cholesterol, was something like 55, and his LDL was 110. And I'm like, okay, now, what was the reason why he put you on this? And he said, well, because I'm 67, and it's going to reduce my risk of having a heart attack. So that's the kind of stories that I deal with almost each and every day. So let's go back to cholesterol. So I've got this one uh, woman, 70 years old. She's had stents placed. She's had high cholesterol since she was 18. She's had all kinds of cardiovascular issues. And I had to get her to trust me that, okay, I'm going to put you on these hormones, and one of them is going to be myodenical estrogen hormone. And I want you to stop that stat. And, you know, I, I could tell there was you know, fear in her eyes. It's like, well, yeah, I need this stat. And, you know, and I said, well, look at your cholesterol. It's still not that good, right? No, it's not. So she stops it. Six months later, she's been on now bioidentical estrogen, bioidentical hormones. We look at her cholesterol, and she says, I've never had cholesterol this good. 
And that was from using bioidentical estrogen. So we've corrected her cholesterol. She has what I like to describe rich and buoyant beachy ball cholesterol versus bullet size. So it's amazing what estrogen can do. The other thing that, uh, and this gal is probably all of 110 pounds, so really skinny. And the other thing that it can help is, you, you already mentioned Fosamax. Yeah. So I said, no, no, you don't need that Fosamax because she's, she's at risk for osteoporosis. And I said, estrogen is going to help manage that as well. So one of the ways we do that um, is through a, a test called uh, NTX or nucleotide peptide. So that's a, a protein marker. And I'll, I'll be honest, when I went to my first conference uh, and I got, had, had to go through 200 plus hours to get certified and then thousands of clinical hours, so face-to-face -face time with patients. So I'm at this first conference and you know, this is related to bone density. And uh, the, the lecturer says, okay, how many of you, and there's 300 of us out there, how many of you physicians, nurse practitioners, have heard of N nucleotide peptide? Hardly any hand goes up. Okay, how many of you use DEXA scan? Well, almost every single hand went up. Yeah, of course everybody knows about DEXA scans. If you guys, some of you women know what DEXA scans are, it's a way to measure bone density. And that DEXA scan has been used for years and years. And it does a decent job measuring bone density, but it's only accurate within a one, perhaps up to a two year window of what's going on with the bones. So this N-nucleotide peptide is a protein that the bone starts to release when it's losing bone density. And it's accurate within a three, maybe a four to five month window. So. I said, okay, let's get your bone density. Let's get this nucleotide peptide protein marker. I said, here it is. Okay, and a year later, we're going to measure it, and you're going to see that you're actually reabsorbing bone with the use of your estrogen. Just by simply using this, I think it might cost $45, maybe it's a $50 marker for that test. I think the DEXA scan is $100. Does that sound about right? I think so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's just amazing the data that's out there, and this is from good, again, peer review literature. I don't have all that literature memorized, so I can't spit that out for you, but uh, it's, you know, I use that test as one measurement for bone density. So for this female, you know, she now has bone reabsorption. She no longer has to be on Phosphamax. She's got good cholesterol, and she happens to feel good, too. I mean, that's, you know, you've talked about the many benefits that patients go, I feel more energetic, I'm sleeping. So let's talk about progesterone, another female hormone. Uh, progesterone, there's so many benefits to that in terms of it's apoptotic, that's a fancy name for, has anti-cancer properties to it. So progesterone helps to reduce cell growth, cell proliferation to the uterine lining, to the breast lining. And all the other benefits that progesterone gives to females is it helps them to sleep well at nighttime. My 83-year-old mom, who's still practicing as a, as a nurse in Oregon, so maybe if you need another nurse. <laughs> yes, she can help. I know she can yeah, help. Yes. Of course she will. Yes. Uh, she doesn't plan on retiring until she's 93. Um, but uh, she begged and she pleaded. And she said, I can't get anybody to put me back on hormones. I was on progesterone and estrogen when I was in my 50s, and those were my best years, and then everybody believes in the myth that you start hormones and then you stop at 10 years, because that myth has just carried on, right? It's not really based on good scientific evidence for data. So I put my mom, and I said, okay, I'm going to put you on these things, and I've got a great resource, you know, the pharmacy in Moses Lake, and I don't know how long she's been on, maybe five or six years, but she's running circles around her octogenarians, her fellow 80-year-olds. And they come up to her on their canes, and they go, well, what is your doing differently? She's all on hormones. And they have felt fallen into that same mythology that, oh, it causes cancer, it causes heart attack, it causes strokes, and off they go, and they leave her alone. So my mom will just continue to go on and on and on. I love her, so I want to keep her around. You guys will probably get to meet her. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah, you will. Yeah, yes. Um, she's, she's, a talk, she's a talker. Okay. 
so let's see, there's progesterone, all the benefits there. There's estrogen, cardiovascular benefit, oh, bone benefit. We talked about that brain benefit. Um, oh my goodness, what estrogen has been found to do is it helps prevent amyloid plaque from developing in the brain. Dementia, how many of you know that dementia is treatable? Is treatable? Mm -hmm. in, in what ways? So there's lots of different ways that you can treat it. Uh, is it reversible? I don't know. Um, I believe that it should be. Um, I know that it is by plaques that creates it and causes it. Um, so if it is created by a plaque, why can't the plaque be removed? I don't know how it's treated, but that's the way I think. Okay. So, so dementia, you know, the, the goal is prevention of uh, getting to that point because what we're finding is, at this point is it's not reversible. I mean, there's medications we can give to kind of slow down the process. So one of the things, actually, you guys were at the same conference, the Brain Health Conference, right? And they talked about the benefits of preventing those amyloid plaques. Now, those amyloid plaques are those same rubbery substance that they've been pulling out of folks that happen to have that, whatever that injection is um, over the past two years. Um, they're thick, rubbery plaque. So it's that same plaque that develops in the brain that gums up the brain system. So estrogen is one of those things that helps prevent that. Estrogen also and thyroid and progesterone have been known to reverse plaque in the arterial system. So, so many benefits there. Uh, let's see. Am I going to see something? You guys want to testosterone. Oh, testosterone. testosterone. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't forget testosterone. Uh, personally, I take testosterone. Don't ever plan on stopping. I like the energy that I have. I like the lean muscle mass. It's natural antidepressants, good for preventing diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular issues. Let's and see. it's not just for men. And it's not just for men, yes. Uh, so I do prescribe testosterone to men and females. Now, I'm not going to be prescribing the same thing, and nor do I recommend that the spouse borrows testosterone from <laughs> one or the other, okay? Uh, and I've heard that happening, you know, where... I might prescribe 200 milligrams for a gentleman, but it might be only two or four or six milligrams or maybe 10 for a female. So you can't borrow. It doesn't work that way. Okay, could cause issues, especially if the woman is borrowing the man's testosterone. So we don't want hair growth and deeper voices. I would say some facial hair. Be facial hair, yes, that would be bad. So testosterone has natural antidepressant properties to it. It also can help with cholesterol. It can help with energy. It can help reduce visceral fat. Visceral fat likes to collect around the gut for most of us when we're in our 50s and our 60s. And visceral fat is actually an independent risk. It's an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So anything we can do to help reduce all those cardiovascular risks, reducing visceral fat is one of them. Giving folks energy, lean muscle mass, all those things. Have I met you before? Because I recognize you, but no. I don't think My so. Oh, are you? Yeah, you, yes. Oh, no. Misha Edwards. Misha Edwards. Okay, maybe I, okay, I you know, recognize it. Well, maybe I have other family here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> here? No, no. Okay, this, is, uh, this, this will be the first time to have family here in this family. Yeah, so. That's one of those spaces. Yeah. So, let's see. I think I covered all. The, okay, let's talk about thyroids. So, the optimization of Thyroid. Oh, this is uh, so again, same as uh, what Janet and Sean have seen the, the experiences when patients come in. Um, you know, oftentimes they're coming in with stories of, yeah, I've told my doc that I'm, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I have no energy, I'm losing my hair. Uh, what can you do for me? And the common response I get back from from my or from their doctors is well everything's fine you're in the reference range I don't know what's wrong just go in and exercise and you know, eat better and, and not to take away from that because really eating better and exercise those are the foundational pieces of good health and wellness and then you add you start adding the other layers such as the hormones such as the thyroid so thyroid um, is an interesting uh, you know it's just thyroid is actually it's such a potent powerful hormone and we need all those hormones working synergistically the way I believe God designed our 
unique, incredible bodies. And the mechanisms that how everything works is so intricate, so detailed, so complex. But we really need all these systems working so well together. So thyroid plays a huge role in that. Thyroid, when we optimize it, and again, most of us are used to going and seeing our practitioners, our docs, and they look at TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And they usually look at it and go, yeah, it's fine, right? Yeah, you're, you're, just, you're, you're just fine. The, the standard for the longest time, and I think we're going to start moving back to that, is the combination of T4 and T3. So four iodine molecules and three iodine molecules. Three iodine molecules, those are the thyroid molecules we want circulating out in the tissue and to the cellular level. That's where we get reduction of visceral fat. That's where we get good brain energy, metabolism. Helps use up what's called free radical oxygen. Helps with the immune system. And for a lot of, um, you know, men get this too, but a lot of females come in and they describe brain fog. Does that sound familiar? You know, brain fog, or I get that afternoon blob, or I'm, I've got cold feet, cold hands, I'm miserable, I have no energy, those kind of things. So when I look at labs, I'll look at TSH, I'll look at free T4, the inactive thyroid. I, I kind of call that the, the bank or the storehouse. We want enough of that T4 hanging out there to be converted into T3, the active metabolite. So I'll look at all those levels, and oftentimes I'll see T3s in the reference range, and that reference range is 2.2 to, I think it's 4.2. Uh, they might vary from lab to lab, but it's a pretty wide reference range. And I'm just going to side note, how they came up with reference ranges is basically collecting data on people coming to clinics and hospital settings. So it's based on sick people. We don't collect data on all 330 million Americans. It's just not possible. We do have a subpopulation, healthy military men and women. That's where we kind of know where some of the optimal ranges are on thyroid. So folks will come in and they're free T3. That's the active metabolite will be sitting at 2.4, 2.5. Again, it's within the normal range. And then their doctor said, well, that's not it. So you move on, let's do something different. And where I've worked with patients now for all these years, thousands of patients, where I go, no, let's push it up closer to 4.2 on that higher end, and maybe a little higher depending on each person. So it's individualized. And I've done that, and I've had folks come back and go, wow, I feel I have more energy, no more brain fog, I'm losing weight because it does help with metabolism. I can't use it for that purpose. I can maybe off-label use it for that, but people just feel much better optimizing their thyroid. That's huge. I'm trying to think if I can come up with a story on, on that one. Do um, you have any stories of patients with thyroid with optimized with thyroid? Oh, I can use myself. You can use yourself. Yeah, oh, yeah. Actually, so I'll use myself. So after our second child, you know, when you're pregnant, they always check your thyroid, right, Melinda? Mm -hmm. They always watch your thyroid. After my second child was born, um, they said, well, you're a little anemic, and so that's, you know, you, you're running a business, you have kids, you're, you're just... You're just tired, you're overwhelmed, you just need to repair. And I'm like, no, there's something really, really wrong with me. This is not me. I don't feel myself. I wasn't sleeping right. I wasn't thinking right either. I was upset over things that really didn't matter. So finally I said, you know what? Um, I know I'm not, I'm not that crazy person that you're portraying me to be because I go in and they say there's nothing wrong with you. I'm like, there's something seriously wrong. I, this isn't right. I'm going to the bathroom, ignoring my children for a few minutes and having an adult time out because I was overwhelmed over things that didn't matter. You know, what toddlers do and babies do, it's normal, right? So finally I found a nurse practitioner who was in the Tri-Cities, it wasn't Carl at this point, who actually the first thing she did was do a physical exam and I had a, wow, a swollen you. thyroid. I actually had a border almost. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We optimized my thyroid and I felt like a new person. It was, it was night and day. And for me, it was, I, I felt like I had control again, because I think hormones don't just play on, you know, just your metabolism. It was how we think and feel. And I was exhausted. And once I was sleeping and once I felt rested, 
you know, all the other pieces fall into place. And really, when we start having issues with our thyroid, I think it's more of an inflammation problem. Like, there's an inflammatory reason for that to happen. So, right. this lady, she looked at my T, my free T4. She looked at my free T3. And I did iodine for a short period, but that I don't do anymore because my iodine levels are normal. So, I don't supplement with that anymore. But, mm -hmm. but it was a home run for mom and probably the kids. And her husband. <laughs> yeah. For that. You know, I, I want to just, I want to um, piggyback on that is that, you know, for any of you that have been to traditional doctors and you go and they take the TSH lab test and they say you're normal, which many of you have had those stories. We hear it all the time. We just roll our eyes. You know, let's just, I, I like to give rational analogies. And I like to say, you know, I'm not a very smart person. Um, I don't call myself a scientist. I just want to think rationally. I want to teach my patients that. So thyroid drugs have been out for armor thyroid, porcine thyroid has been out for a hundred years since the early 1900s. We have had TSH testing since 1970. So we've been treating thyroid dysfunction way before there were these fancy tests. So tests are just a tool to go along with symptoms and history and physical exam. Um, that's all it is. And that includes with all hormones. I was just, when we were down here, we had somebody call us um, and this gal was having hormone related cycling issues. And, you know, but her hormones checked out fine. Well, she's perimenopause. Her cycles are all over the place. I'm not saying it's a waste of time to get your hormones checked when you're perimenopause, but one day they'll be fine, one day they won't. So it's like you have to know how to interpret that test. So optimal test is optimal levels are what's important and no go to a provider that knows what test to order and how to interpret them. So they don't just say, well, you know, I, I guess you're normal. It's all in your head because which we've all heard that. It just, it, it infuriates Janet and I. That's one of the things that we do is we, we educate patients that no, you're not crazy and we can send you to somebody that can really fix you. So um, very rewarding for us. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that, that helped me to kind of recall just even my practice partner, Olga, uh, who has struggled with cholesterol, not being able to bring it down, and I optimized her thyroid. And thyroid, that's another, I've got uh, at least 11 research articles, another 25 research articles where it talks about optimizing a thyroid pre-T3 is also a way to help your cholesterol become more rich and buoyant. Make it work for you, not against you. And then I've got lots of other stories where I had a, a recent uh, nurse uh, who's uh, done travel cruise, cruise ship nursing, and these last three years have just been a deep, dark depression, miserable for her. And she thought it was maybe it's because I'm not working or the whole COVID insanity that's taken place. So we optimized her hormone, optimized her thyroid. And this last visit I had with her, she was so just elated, so excited. She says, I'm going to climb a mountain. So she was ready to go climb a mountain. She had that much of a change. And she said, Carl, I didn't realize how deep and dark the world had become for me. But just by changing and optimizing her hormones, her thyroid, I haven't even talked about DHEA. That's another hormone that we look at. So that has to do with your adrenals. The adrenals sit on top of the kidneys, and we need that. That's our cortisol. That's our fight or flight. That's you know what has been probably for so many of us dragged down to the very basement from the stressors. Um, you know, I'm working with business owners and business owners, you know, they get their DHA, that adrenal knocked down to smithereens because of the stress. And so we optimize that. There's so many benefits with reducing insulin resistance, helps with the immune system, natural antidepressant. I actually saw in my community, um, there's probably 21, 20, 20, you know, everything's a blur in the past three years, but uh, this uh, pastor of a large church in our community came in and said, I'm depressed, get me an antidepressant. And I said, well, let's let's check your adrenals first. So I checked his DHEA levels, and men need to be 400 to 600, and his was sitting at 70. And I said, well, let's put you on this DHEA. It's made from yams, and on days you eat yams, you don't necessarily have to supplement, but um, let's just try that first, because I'm like Sean and Janet, uh, I am not one that likes to prescribe a pill for every ill, right. especially an antidepressant, because once you start them, then it's hard to get them off. So I put this pastor on this DHEA supplement, and he comes back four or five weeks later going, what's in that? I feel great. 
I felt great. And it's like, oh, we're just supplementing your adrenals. You know, we're just repl replacing them. So just things like that. And I think uh, Sean and Janet also talked about, yeah, there's so many things that folks will come in, they're depressed, we correct their hormones, we correct their thyroid, their adrenals, and that helps. I think that's it. I mean, you guys that was great, Carl. Yeah, yeah, you did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just want to add to it a little bit. Is you know, I don't know, I don't know about Carl. I'm sure it's the same, but I know Janet and I. Every day we have stories like that. That's why it's so rewarding what we do. And you know, we practice pharmacy in the regular realm before we had our own pharmacy, and and I, I can think of one time in at, at, out of the many years I practice in traditional pharmacy where I had a patient actually thank me. And it wasn't for anything like that. It was uh, something way different. And we get it all the time now. And it's it's so, so rewarding. And and let's just, let's let's talk about age for a while. Is that, you know, Jan and I, I'm 52. She's about to be 56. And if you have a doctor that, you know, you're going to the doctor and they say things like, because we get this all the time. Well, I you know, our sex life is not as good as it used to be. And, and I went to the doctor and this is literally a true story. We've told this multiple times. Uh, woman's in her 50s. Our sex life is as good as it used to be. And I went to my doctor and he just said, that's just part of aging. They're lying to you. You're a new doctor. Um, that is an absolute lie. And sex is just as important as water and food, I believe, in a healthy relationship. And there is no reason why when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, that you can't be having the best sex of your life. And I got a story of a, a patient, or, um, patients of ours, and we fixed her, her hormones. They're in, her six, they're in their 60s. And we fixed her hormones, and her husband comes in. He goes, hey, he texts me. He goes, you going to be in your office? I'm like, yeah. He goes, I got to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> so he sits down with me, and, um, and he shuts the door, and he's like, I, I got to do something. I can't keep up with her. You got to do something for me. I can't keep up with her. I'm like, this is awesome. And we get stories like that all the time. People in their 70s. And I remember one time this guy called me and he was having some issues with his – some questions about his testosterone. And his – and they're in their 70s. His wife is yelling in the background because he wants some, some consultation from me about how to dose it and what to do because he's having not really side effects but kind of, but not really. Um, she, she's yelling in the background. They're in their 70s. You tell him you are not stopping your testosterone. I'm like, this is awesome. How cool can this be? So, you know, Carl mentioned his um, mom's friends walking around with canes. You know, I see it when Jan and I see it and we see, I don't care what age they are, but we see people in healthcare. Sometimes you see them in their 50s now. They're walking with a walker. They're bent over like this. Even in their 70s, 80s, there is no reason for that. We have failed them. We can prevent that. And guess what? The answer is not statins. The answer is not Fosamax. The answer is not all these drugs for blood pressure and you name it. In fact, those things will make it worse. Um, you need to liberate yourself from those, take charge of your own health, and hormones is a big, big piece of it. So I always like to say this too. What if Carl almost missed testosterone? And testosterone is my favorite one. I just gave a presentation on testosterone. I have to, I still continue to educate some OBGYNs about, um, yeah, no, women make testosterone also. Great story. And they're like, oh, they don't need testosterone. Well, yeah, they do. Great story. So our kids, as you can imagine, two boys, as you can imagine, they heard hormones all of their life, right? <laughs> so my son got kicked out of his eighth grade science class because he argued with the the teacher because she said that men don't, women don't have testosterone. He goes, Oh yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they do. They just don't have as much. And she's like, no, they don't. And he's like, so we had to actually go in and say, well, yes, they do. They just don't have as much. So, and it's, and it's totally true, but we, we forget that in, in, in health and what if in, in healthcare, what if we had a drug that can increase your bone density, increase your libido, decrease, decrease weight gain around the middle, increase lean body mass, decrease visceral fat, um, decrease erectile dysfunction, increase energy, decrease depression. Um, the list goes on. What if we had a drug like that? It'd be a magic drug, right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what we do? It's called testosterone. And and I mean, you think about the disease I just I just named and the drugs we take for all of those. Another, a few other ones too for women. Um, urinary incontinence. You don't lack some drug for urinary incontinence. Vaginal dryness. You don't. You lack estrogen. Um, 
what's the other one? Chronic UTIs. We treat these things all the time. And look at what women are, take for these things. It's like, are you kidding me? What do they lack? They lack hormones. They don't lack these drugs. So as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this. Melinda. So one thing that people ask me now that we're starting to bring this type of therapy into 7VIP is what is the difference between pharmaceutical hormone therapy like levothyroxine and things like that compared to bioidentical hormone therapy? So I'd love you guys to describe that. A, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So <laughs> let's just, let's define bioidentical versus natural versus synthetic, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go back to Latin here first, okay? And unfortunately, I'm not kidding here, um, they don't teach Latin anymore in pharmacy school, so I'll ask pharmacists, I'll ask pharmacists, well, what does bioidentical mean? And they're like, well, I don't know. I said, what does bio mean? Bio means life, all right? Identical to what's in our bodies, okay? So bioidentical, identical to what's in our bodies. So let's talk about natural. Are you guys familiar with Premarin? Okay, they don't teach this in pharmacy school anymore either, but Premarin stands for pregnant mare's urine. Most new doctors don't know that either. They're like, Prem pregnant mare's urine, is that what Premarin is? Yeah, it's horse pee. I don't, I, I don't pussyfoot around anymore. It is horse pee. It should never, ever be prescribed anymore. It's been around since 1947. It was the first estrogen that was ever, ever, um, ever uh, made. Uh, it's literally these, they, they get horses pregnant and they isolate, estrogen goes high in pregnancy and they isolate out of the urine. They isolate the estrogen. They do standardize it to an estradiol estrone ratio. There's also eclin in there, eclin for equine estrogen, which is not, natural to us. Is Premarin natural? Is Premarin natural? Well, it comes from a horse. Yeah. It's natural, right? Is it bioidentical? No. Not to humans. No, it's natural. So here's the analogy I give to doctors that still prescribe it and believe in it. I'll ask them, I'll say, and I'm going to date myself here. Um, in the 1930s, when we first found out what was causing type 2 diabetes, and it was lack of insulin, we weren't able to um, use DNA recombinant technology to make human insulin. So we used insulin from pigs and cows. We took their pancreas and isolated insulin from pigs and cows. So I'll ask a doctor that's prescribing Premarin. It's like, um, what about estradiol? They're like, well, I think Premarin's is fine. And I'm like, well, do you remember pork insulin and porcine insulin and beef insulin? Yeah. Well, why don't we prescribe it anymore? Well, because we have human insulin. Bingo. Right. We should never, ever prescribed primer ever because we have other options if we didn't have options back in the 40s i get it maybe um but now we have estradiol um which is you know a bioidentical estrogen the same estrogen we make in our bodies and here's the thing with primer follow the money made 1947 remember drugs are supposed to have a patent of about 15 years from the time they're discovered to and it takes about seven years to get the market so they got about seven or eight years to make money there is no generic primer and there never will be why because when you take horse pee and you isolate estrogen out of it, one horse's pee is different from the other horse's pee. They don't even know what all is in it. They do standardize it to an estradiol estrone ratio, but you can't copy if you don't know what's in it. Why if theirs has bank? They, they have a product that they can nobody can ever copy. I mean, they and and and, and the FDA goes along with it. Um, doctors that prescribe it go along with it. Pharmacists that dispense it go along with it. I think it's a racket. I don't think it should ever be used anymore. So, Premarin is natural. Not necessarily bioidentical, or it's not bioidentical. So let's talk about synthetic. Okay, you mentioned levothyroxine. Mm -hmm. So Carl already mentioned that levothyroxine is also known as T4, which is basically a tyrosine, which is a, an amino acid, pretty simple molecule, um, relatively speaking, and four um, iodines. T3 is a tyrosine with three iodines. Simple molecule. Um, we get this all the time when somebody says, well, I want natural thyroid. Is this levothyroxine lyothyroidine natural? No, it is not. It is synthetic. It is made in a laboratory. Pretty simple molecule to, make, to, to synthesize tyrosine and, and, and iodine, okay? It is made in a lab, but it is made to the exact same copy that your body makes up. So it is synthetic, but it is not, it is not, um, but it is bioidentical. That's the, that's the thing to, to take away from that. Now, so on thyroid also, we'll get it all the time. It's like, there is a natural thyroid, porcine thyroid. I, I'm still a big believer in porcine thyroid, but porcine thyroid is, does come from um, a, a pig and it comes from a pig's thyroid, literally ground up. It's literally ground up pig's thyroid standardized to a T3, T4 ratio. Um, so it is natural. 
It's not bioidentical. I'm not saying it's bad. Porcine thyroid, I think, is better than levothyroxine for most patients. Um, not all patients have Hashimoto's or some kind of inflammatory condition can tolerate uh, porcine thyroid. And, you know, we see the kind of patients that fall through those cracks. So it's like, and some patients can do just fine on levothyroxine. Levothyroxine is a non, not as active as lyothyronine, which is T3. Um, but um, some patients, they'll convert it just fine. They'll convert T4 to T3 just fine. So they don't need other medication or, or uh, like a T3. But a lot of times they do. And that's when we send them to somebody like Carl. So I mean, natural experience on that is <laughs> only about 10% are able to do that. So I yeah, find is, is it that low? It is pretty low. Is it really? Okay. Yeah. So I, I use the either compounded or the porcine based. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's <laughs> synthetic versus bioidentical versus natural. Okay. So now let's go into why hormones get a bad rap and like, oh, well, you shouldn't, you know, I, I mean, still there's, you know, fallacies out there where you shouldn't be on hormones um, more you probably, than five. You probably ask I bet most folks go, well, yeah, I heard. Yeah, 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 right. You shouldn't be on hormones more than five years because they're dangerous. So I'll ask a doctor, okay, here's a true story. I, I love telling stories. So um, one of the drugs we make up is a, it's called estriol vaginal cream. And a lot of traditional gynecologists and urologists use it. Um, works great for vaginal atrophy, prevent UTIs, and for urinary incontinence. I think every postmenopausal woman should be on some kind of estrogen vaginal cream if they're not on testosterone cream vaginally um, or both. Because if they don't have UTI, chronic UTIs and they don't have urinary incontinence, they will eventually. So usually the first symptom is, is dry vagina. And then after that, they're going to get those symptoms if they don't stay on it. So we always tell our patients, it's like, because they'll ask us, okay, I've got vaginal dryness, painful intercourse. Is this going to help? I'm like, yes, this is awesome. I love it when I get that diagnosis and we're giving them estriol vaginal cream. Because I tell them, I said, you know what? In seven to 10 days, your vaginal dryness is going to be gone, gone. I, I can almost guarantee that. So then they'll say this. They'll say, you know, I'm 52 years old. Well, how long am I going to have to use this? I'm like, well, so you're not going to magically start producing estrogen again. Your, your, your ovaries are done. So if you don't want vaginal dryness, and you want to have a good, healthy sex life, you will take this rest of your life. So then on the, I tell doctors the same thing. I'll say, so if a woman will talk about that same subject, vaginal health or urinary incontinence, I'll ask a doctor, if a woman has urine, so no, I, I, I took her off. So patient calls in, I'm, I'm actually calling her to ask her about a refill of her prescription. I'm like, well, I know she haven't refilled. It's about time to refill your prescription. I know she haven't refilled it recently. Estrella vaginal cream. She's like, no, I got great news. She's in her 80s. I got great news. I went to the doctor and I've been on this for two years. My urinary incontinence um, 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 uh, cleared up. I don't have urinary incontinence anymore. So the doctor took me off of it. Oh, woohoo. Well, great. So you're going to have a dry vagina here in a few weeks <laughs> and your urinary incontinence is going to come back in a year. And I'm like, how ignorant is this doctor? It's like, oh, are you, oh! I mean, seriously. Yeah. So I'll ask a doctor. So if a patient has urinary incontinence and you prescribe XYZ drug, we'll get Ditropan, Detrol, whatever. How long will you prescribe that drug? Well, well, the rest of their life. Oh, okay. So if a patient has osteoporosis, um, how long will you prescribe that drug, doctor? Well, well, the rest of her life. Oh, but you want them only to take hormones for five years. Okay. Even though, remember, all the things that testosterone did for us? It's more than just bones. It's more than just, you know, vaginal health. There's a lot of other benefits, right? Fast forward, WHI study. WHI study 2002. This is where a lot of the misinformation, gosh, I love that word. Don't you guys love that word now? I, I call it mythology. <laughs> mythology, there you go. <laughs> um, 2002, WHI study comes out. This is where all that stuff for a maximum of five years comes up. So what does the WHI study say? World, uh, World Health Initiative for hormones. Uh, Poorly designed study. The people that had heart attacks in the study were ten years older than the ones that didn't in the placebo in the in the um, in the placebo group. So poorly designed study already. But here's what we can take away from the WHI study. The WHI study showed this: Premarin plus medroxyprogesterone acetate, Provera, causing increased risk of cardiovascular risk of cardiovascular risks, heart attacks and strokes. Okay. All right. Is Premarin different than uh, estradiol? Okay. So is hydroxyprogesterone acetate, a synthetic progestin, Provera, which was used to try it, which was made so they could patent something that acted like progesterone. Is it the same as progesterone? No, it's absolutely not. Progesterone is a bioidentical hormone. 
Provera was made 10 years post Premarin because Premarin was increasing the risk of uterine cancer because they weren't given progesterone along with it. So um, they tried to, they couldn't patent progesterone. So they patented Provera um, to copy progesterone in the uterus. And you'll still get this from all kinds of doctors. If you don't have a uterus, you don't need progesterone. Oh, but, well, doctor, I got to ask you a question. Man, this is a, progesterone must be a, a really unique hormone. It, it, progesterone is that one hormone that only works in one tissue in the body? I mean, I thought hormones worked all over the body. I mean, you know, progesterone doesn't work in the brain. It doesn't work in, in, in the skin. It doesn't work um, in the breast tissue. Only in, only in the uterus. Wow, progesterone is magic. I'm being sarcastic here. Um, <laughs> progesterone, just because you have, if you, just because you don't have a uterus doesn't mean you, mean you don't need progesterone because it works in many different places in the brain, in the body, including the brain, like Carl said, to help you sleep and it decrease anxiety. So, when I use the analogy of here's how different medroxyprogesterone acetate is from progesterone, synthetic progestin. This is the one where I, I, I question when gynecologists tell me, well, well, they're close to the same. I'm taught in pharmacy school, they're the same. I'm taught they're the same. If you look at my ninth edition, Goodman and Gilman, they're in the same category, and it's like, oh my gosh, because they are so different. Here's how different they are. Back to Latin, okay? Progesterone. What does progesterone mean? Literally mean pro for support. Gesterone, gestation. Without progesterone, no lute in the luteal phase, you cannot get pregnant. You cannot maintain a pregnancy without progesterone. Okay? Progesterone. What do we use Depo Provera for? Medroxyprogesterone acetate. To prevent control. Birth control. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're close in structure, man. They must work the same in the body. Right when I tell an OBGYN that, they're like, oh my gosh, they are different. Yeah, they're way different. One of them prevents pregnancy, one of them helps support a pregnancy. That's how different they are. So this WHI study about, you can't, all you can say from the WHI study is primarin, primarin, acetate, increased risk of cardiovascular accidents. Okay. That doesn't was, say anything about was, estradiol. It was something like a 0.8. So it was very small, very small anyways. Very small. And, and again, the age group difference. Um, so it's it's worthless. I love, I love talking about it because mm -hmm. it really gives bioidentical hormones um, a lot more credit. So it has nothing to do with estradiol and, and progesterone. But it's from that study that, you know, I get the phone calls, hey, yep. you, can't have, yep. you can't have the patient on progestin. It's not progestin, it's progesterone. Right, right. And, and you, you, it's so important you differentiate those. Here's, here's another thing that I use with my rational, rational thinking. Testosterone causes heart attacks in men, right? We've all heard that. There's a black box warning on testosterone if you open it up from FDA-approved products, whether it be injection or whether it be androgel. Okay, all right, let, let's just think rational. Take a deep breath. Testosterone causes heart attacks. Okay, hmm. all right. So you're not going to prescribe testosterone. It has all those benefits because it causes heart attacks. So when are, is men's testosterone the highest? Yeah, 19, 20, early 20s. Dude. Men in that age group have heart attacks. Right. Yeah. I mean, no, the answer is no. I mean, so it's kind of like, you know, they used to say testosterone caused prostate cancer. Same thing. Okay. That's from the 1960s. Study. Exactly. And now they've completely debunked that. But let, let's just think rationally. So same thing with, same thing with women's hormones and, and, and breast cancer. So outside of, you know, there's a lot of things. And this is one thing I say. When it comes to breast cancer, there's environmental, there's genetic, um, and, and some we can't control, some things we can't control. Um, but let's just think rational about uh, about it. Um, when are women's hormones the highest? When they're 20s and 30s, and of course when they're pregnant, they're sky high. Do they get breast cancer? No, I mean, usually women that get breast cancer are are, are right at perimenopause or, or postmenopause when their hormones are low. Now, there's a lot of things, a lot of drugs that can cause that. Birth control pills are, are, are one of them. When you look at a lot of the younger breast cancers, it's like, are they in birth control? Were they in birth control pills? Sure. What are birth control pills? They're synthetic progestin, synthetic estrogens. Way different than bioidentical hormones. So, I mean, let's just think rational about it. Um, yeah, so that's, does that answer your question? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce you a little bit. Um, since you're such a rock star, I'll let you introduce <laughs> yourself. Come on. So speaking of speaking of healthy and speaking of uh, lots of energy, um, Melinda is is it right? And I love what she's doing um, in so many ways. And hormones is a perfect perfect adjunct to what she's doing now. 
because it's 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 all about health and wellness, and that that that's that's what that's what we preach, and we love working with people like Linda. So Linda, I'll let you introduce yourself. And- Thanks. All right, hello. I know most of you guys. Some of you are new and family, um, and so and many of you guys have come in and done IVs. Some of you have worked with at the hospital, and so it's a pretty cool community. Um, so my name is Melinda Adams, owner of 7B IV, and that's my husband, Barrett Adams. Um, he does all the behind the scenes so I can take care of patients. And then Julie and Jessica are um, employees of 7B IV as well as we are growing. The goal is to grow into a wellness clinic here in Sandpoint um, and not just offer the IV vitamins that we, we do now, but to start offering a lot more functional medicine, wellness type of stuff. And Carl is our medical director. Uh, Cause you know, I can't do it without an amazing medical director. And I'm so glad that I have. Him. So um, started 7B IV a year ago as like a little mobile IV service. And I've been, you know, I've been a nurse working in hospitals for over a decade. Kind of like what they were talking about in Carl, I saw a system that just wasn't working. I The pill for every ill and growing up a little bit more on the natural side myself, there was a lot of things that just didn't make sense. We're, we're constantly giving the medicine, but we're not teaching lifestyle and we're not teaching nutrition. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that those of us who have been educated in the Western medicine system, we're not, we aren't educated in deep nutritional medicine and we're not educated in deep functional medicine. There is a, an amazing plethora of information and science to back this kind of, you know, approach, this kind of medical approach, but you know, it's, it's not something that we typically hear about. So it's something I'm turning very passionate into. I'm heading back to school this fall to become a practitioner um, and to be a functional medicine practitioner. So I'm really, really passionate about it. So anyway, um, you know, just add more busyness to my already busy plate. <laughs> um, so that being said, we are in the process of renovating and opening um, a new wellness clinic here pretty soon. We're under construction right now, which I'm really excited about. And so uh, we're, you know, Carl is going to be available to help with the bioidentical hormone therapy that we're going to be offering to patients. We're still going to be doing the IV vitamins, but we're going to also be bringing in a lot of other things, ozone, um, red light therapy, um, halo therapy, which is a natural respiratory treatment that's just as effective, if not better, than pharmaceutical um, treatments. So my goal as a nurse and eventually as I become a practitioner, my goal is to come at you with functional medicine. Um, My goal is to get you off of medications and get you over more to where your body is functioning on its own and not medicated, you know, behavior. There's plenty of clinics out there that will give you the medications, but as you can see, as I'm starting to align with some pretty amazing people who have the same goals that I do, there's, I, I want to offer a different approach for our community. So I'm super passionate about it. So any of you who are interested in wanting to like dive into hormone therapy, you know, with um, Carl, you can, we can get you scheduled and um, eventually we're going to have lab work available to where we can, you know, do all your lab work and, and things like that. So eventually it's going to, my goal is to have it a one-stop shop. We're still in that awkward growing stage <laughs> as I go from this little 400 square foot place that I'm in right now into the, the larger clinic. So anyway, nice to meet all of you and nice to see those of you who were able to come and then we'll just open up the floor for questions. Yeah. yeah. yeah sounds hey. good. Sounds good. <laughs> so I, I just want to define functional medicine for those of you that might not know what the term is. Um, functional medicine is um, more that we treat 
we fix problems instead of treat symptoms. You know, I've already talked about some of the pharmaceuticals that are prescribed for, you know, whatever symptom, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Well, we got a drug for that. Or you have reflux. Well, we got a drug for that. It's like, okay, well, GI drugs just bug the heck out of me. Cause it's like, you know, they're, most GI drugs, all, I can almost say all, I don't say that very often, are completely unnecessary. If we have a problem with our, especially chronic, chronically, if we have a problem with our GI, it's diet related, period. I mean, seriously. And then believe me, I used to be 60 pounds heavier and I had reflux. And when I lost weight and changed my diet, my reflux went away. If I didn't do that, I would still be fat and be on drugs and more and more drugs. So, um, you know, it, Functional medicine fixes problems instead of just treating symptoms. And I will say this, I say this often, hormones were functional medicine before we even knew what functional medicine was. Yes. And I talked about some of the things that, the problems that we fix with hormones, and um, that's, it's true functional medicine. It really is. I mean, let me I give another example of, you know, I mean, now we have drugs to, this one just irritates the heck out of me. I mean, we have drugs, basically antidepressant drugs, um, um, being used to treat hot flashes. That is the silliest. I, I, I couldn't believe it when it happened. It's like, well, I mean, hot flashes are caused from low estrogen and we're, we're using antidepressants. And if you've ever seen effects are prescribed for anything, including um, hot flashes, it's in, incredibly difficult to get off of, which is exactly Big Pharma's goal. I mean, really. I mean, Big Pharma's, our um, effects are is like trying to get off crack. I've never tried to get off of effects are. A, That's a laugh. Laugh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't try to get off a texture, but no, I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never smoked crack either. So, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's true functional medicine. I, I, so, let's open it up for questions. Do you have any questions for us? Yes. It's actually more of um, to satisfy my own curiosity. I lost many pregnancies, and then my two children I do have, I was on progesterone for, but I had like no breast milk. So I you had no, no what? No breast milk. No breast milk. Okay. So I heard a rumor that that causes low to no breast milk. Is that true? That progesterone decreases breast, breast milk production? Yeah. No. Okay. In, in fact, it's it, actually the problem you had is you didn't produce enough progesterone. Okay. And that okay. was even while lactating. Okay. And I went so, off of it once, you know, I got through a certain part of the pregnancy. Right. Yep. And, okay. Right. And so that was the whole problem with maintaining the pregnancy because usually yeah. when you become pregnant, your body should start producing more to maintain it. Okay. So many times you'll have women that go through multiple miscarriages and their lack of progesterone is the problem. Okay. It's, it's, and, and really for most people, and, and I don't know how Carl feels about it, but for most women, I would prefer they just stay on their progesterone until they deliver. I would not, yeah, it, it, I would not take it away even in the second trimester. Yeah, because that's the thing when I stopped mine second or somewhere around there. Once everything was like, yes, yeah, yeah. it standard. We, we, we hear stories like that all the time. Okay. Here's a story. I mean, we, it, it's, it's so sad what our medical system does. We had a, a, um, a couple that was trying to conceive, and they came to us because they had been at Wits Inn. They, they had spent thousands and thousands of dollars on a fertility specialist. They come to this. This is no lie. It's almost it's almost like I would make this up. But they come to us and we ask them their story. And it's like, well, it just sounds like you probably need progesterone. So they spent thousands of dollars of fertility. A fertility specialist never checked their progesterone. Wow. Remember what progesterone means? Progestation. You can't get pregnant without it. Yeah. We gave them for a hundred day supply of progesterone seventy seven dollars. Wow. She was pregnant within a month. Nice. Right. Well, I, I here's the sad part. Here's here's one of the sad parts. So uh, this is a different patient. But same thing happened. She was pregnant within eight weeks. Also, she went to OBGYN and fertility and blah. Pregnant within eight, eight weeks, primary care provider, a uh, nurse practitioner, says, okay, great. We got you pregnant. This is awesome. Um, we kind of did it in non-traditional means. And this is awesome. You know, she kind of did it secretly because she works in a big clinic. And she goes, well, now it's my duty to refer you to, to, to OB. So she referred her to OB. The OB doctor takes her off progesterone. She miscarries. <laughs> Unreal. It, it gives me chills and it makes me mad. And and when you're pregnant, I, I mean, it, it just it just tells you the insanity and the ignorance of, of, you know, a gynecologist is supposedly the most educated person about hormones when it comes to women, right? And um, I will tell you, I could give you, well, you know what? If you know this, medroxyprogesterone, write this down and you'll know more than most pharmacists and most doctors. If medroxyprogesterone acetate and progesterone are not the same. If you know that, which I already discussed the differences, you'll know more than most gynecologists. I'm not kidding. 
So that's how ignorant they are. Now, um, not all of them, not all of them. It's getting better. So um, when you take that progesterone when you're pregnant, I mean, once once the core prostitute starts producing pregnant, uh, starts producing progesterone, especially after the second, third trimester, third trimester, your, your levels are hundreds and hundreds of times what they are when you're not pregnant. I mean, so taking somebody off, it's it, it probably, especially third trimester, I'm not against keeping you on it, but it's probably not doing much anymore because you're still pregnant. You're producing a whole bunch of, pre, uh, of progesterone, but the first couple months, three or four months, very, very important. So, and yes, progesterone, actually the drop of progesterone after pregnancy is what can decrease lactation. Yeah. So yeah. progesterone is very important for lactation. Yeah. Also, in fact, if you give enough progesterone, a woman's breast, sorry, it's, a woman's it's, breast will feel full. Yeah. His, 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 the woman's breast will feel full. So that's one thing. Like. Sorry, go call. No, so progesterone drop is also what causes postpartum depression. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you have okay, so many sense. females that want to get on antidepressants. Right? That's another thing. It's like, you know, think about how good women, most women, not all women, but most women feel when they're pregnant. Yeah. A lot of them feel the best they've ever had. And when you look at some of the other things, I mean, some of people have the best sex they've ever had when they were pregnant. Yeah. So think about what hormones do to, to that kind of stuff. So great question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I have a similar experience, but you can't get progesterone without a doctor's prescription, right? That is correct. Yeah, yeah, that is correct. But you know what? We, we have all kinds of referrals all over the nation that we can, that we can refer you to. So, um, and we don't, we don't mess around anymore. We used to, well, yeah, we'll work with your primary. We'll make some recommendations. We don't do that. We've got enough hormone specialists around the nation. We're like, you know, no, we're not going to waste your, my time or your time. We're going to send you to somebody that knows what they're doing and you will, you will really appreciate it. So, and I will say this too. Um, most of the hormone specialists that we work with do not bill insurance and, you know, insurance, and, and it's purposeful, I think, the way the pharmaceutical industry and and insurance company have colluded, literally, to create a cartel, which is what they've done, to make it so a, pa- a doctor has to see 40 patients a day um, in order to um, make any kind of income. So when you're seeing a patient for five minutes, can you talk to him about diet? Can you talk to him about, um, you know, nu- nutrition, sleep, all that kind of stuff? No, but you can write a prescription in 30 seconds. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. You got reflux. Yeah, here. Here you go. But if you, you mention progesterone, they, they won't have time. No, to exactly. Talk about it, right? They don't have time to talk about it. So, I mean, that's that's a great that's a, a great question. How often, so once you get somebody on hormones, how often do you have to monitor their labs and generally speak? I'll let Carl yeah, uh, so address that. I generally, I tell my men uh, when I get them started, it's like, Hey, we're going to start you on this and you're good to go. Men are usually much more simple creatures. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he said it, not me. I said it. <laughs> okay. it, it is true. <laughs> yeah. okay. There you go. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Testosterone and uh, DHA. Yes. Uh, but for females, I right. tell them, you know, it might be two or three, maybe four cycles of looking at labs and going, okay. And it's, it's based on how you're feeling, plus we're looking at labs. So there's, for example, progesterone. The optimal is 10 to 21, but I recently had a, a patient two or three weeks ago, and hers was 37. And I just mentioned just briefly, I was going to dial down or decrease progesterone, and she gave me this look, and I said, or not, we'll leave it. <laughs> it's personal. <laughs> but that usually takes two or three cycles of labs every eight weeks or so, and then I go, great, we're, we're right where we need to be. Any other questions? I have another question. Yes. Well, my daughter was a preemie. She was six weeks early and she was really tiny. And they told me that she needs to be on Synthroid. And she was on Synthroid basically from birth to about three. And now she's nine and she's I, she's way further along puberty wise than I was at her age. And I don't know if there's a correlation between the Synthroid she was on and then like she's nine and she'll be 10 this October. but. You know, she's acne and her body's changing a lot from my menu to nine year old, but I don't know. And we drink raw milk and stuff, and hopefully, drink like everybody's scared about the milk and corn, the hormones and that. So I don't know. Uh, you want to address that? I mean, leave out that rock scene alone shouldn't affect that. Okay. But I'll let Janet kind of. No, unless, I mean, again, because uh, the, 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 the adrenals, the thyroid, yeah. the okay. hormones, they, they all do play a role. Okay. So if they're kind of just keying in on the thyroid, but they're not looking at her other hormones. And no, and she hasn't been on anything since she was about three. 
and she's oh, okay. nine now. So if I didn't know, like, early in life, having that for every day for three years. Was, well, for, yeah. I mean, for one thing, I mean, obviously she had a very stressful event when she was younger. So yeah. when you talk oh, yeah. about adrenals and stuff like that, um, you know, yeah. yeah. So um, there could be some of that that could have affected, okay. um, you know, but... The levothyroxine alone. No, oh, I, yeah. I agree right. with it. It's not. It's 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 culmination. I mean, it was traumatic birth, mm -hmm. and then what you're describing for me is that your hormone production wasn't optimal either. Right. Right. Yeah. So you know, part of that could be just genetic and, and okay. life. Okay. You know, um, the concern I would have is that you know we want to make sure that she doesn't keep going down that path and have irregular cycles because mm -hmm. that's going to be a problem. You know, because okay. she's going to set up the same scenario right. for her. Yeah. It would definitely be worth when she's, you know, turning, you know, that puberty age to start looking and go, go to a specialist and have those hormones yeah. worked out. Yeah. Especially if you have any kind of cycling issues. And remember, yeah. cycling issues can be, we, we see all the time, cycling issues can mean that headaches. You know, how many women does it, do people know that have headaches that follow their cycles? Mm -hmm. And we, we, we prescribe all these fancy drugs for them. And it's like, well, you just need progesterone. Get progesterone, headaches go away. I mean, you know, so simple thing. Anything, is, anything that follows a cycle, progesterone. Think of progesterone. Yes, sir. So I was on testosterone for a number of years and um, by a syringe. Um, it was real pain, but you know, <laughs> literally. <laughs> I went to it all. You know, yeah. Off because I, I got paranoid about the risk of heart attack or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so as far as delivery methods, like the androgel gel would still be the syringe, the, the, the best. So as way. yeah. So um, as combine pharmacists, um, you know, we can make testosterone in a lot more concentrated form than androgel. Androgel is not as concentrated. Androgel is a gel, not a cream. We make a cream. I'm not a fan of, 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 of injections, and here's why. I'm not saying they don't work. They're probably better than nothing, but here's why. And, I mean, this is just, you know, um, these are just facts. So our skin is developed wonderfully to prevent poisons from being absorbed, okay? I'll use that, I'll use that analogy. So um, anytime we bypass that skin, uh, and we inject something, which is what we're literally doing, we have a high peak. So, and I'll talk to, I got into a debate with an endocrinologist one time, smart endocrinologist from Virginia Mason. And she was bragging about, well, I, I do, I don't have high peaks of dollars in my mid because I do, I do twice weekly injections. I'm like, oh, okay. So have you ever done a level right after injection? She says, well, not to be ridiculous, it'd be super high. Exactly. Um, so, Here's the problem with super high testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. Testosterone aromatizes. That's a fancy name for a protein enzyme that causes testosterone to convert into estradiol. So if that happens and you get too much of it, you'll, you'll get what's called gynecomastia in women and men will go grow boobs. So um, we don't want that to happen. So yeah, sure, you can take an estrogen blocker, <laughs> which, okay, estrogen is important. Don't, don't forget that for men. In right. fact, men have just as much estrogen as women when they're not pregnant. No lie. The only thing that makes us different between hormones and men and women, other than some cycling at the luteal phase in pregnancy, is testosterone. That's what makes us different. Men have estradiol, men have progesterone. Those are just facts, okay? The, the testosterone is what differentiates us. So um, we make a cream, and that cream, we, we have them apply it underneath the scrotal area. We're the only pharmacy in the nation that's ever done a study of the absorption of their testosterone cream over time. So what does that mean? So we did a study, one hour post uh, application, two hours post, six hours post, 12 and 24 hour post. Here's the beauty of the cream under, uh, applied to the scrotal area. Now we did, it was an N of one, which means it was just one patient, but we have seen this on thousands of patients. So, but the study was just one patient, but here's what happened. One hour after absorption, goes up to a peak level, okay? Flat line at 1,200, and it's going flat for six hours, going up a little bit, it's up to 1,300 at six hours, comes back down to about 700 at 12 hours, back down to baseline at 24 hours, following diurnal variation. How do we make testosterone in our bodies naturally? In a daily variation. We don't do it once a week or once a month like when you give injections. That's crazy. So cream applied into the scrotal area. I know it's absorbed, thin skin, great blood flow, absorbed very well, 
and it doesn't get those high peaks and low valleys. It follows diurnal variation. So that's how we normally deliver testosterone. Very, very affordable that way. Um, unlike Androgel that comes in like five mil packets and you apply it to your arm and chest. Several times. Yeah. Day to get, right. And multiple packets. Right. And here's the problem with Androgel. Apply to your arm and chest. That's going to be a bigger risk of transfer to, to a woman, which is a problem, like Carl was saying, than if it's underneath your scrotal area. Not that it can't transfer underneath your scrotal area, but hopefully somebody, somebody's going to be underneath your scrotal area. You're pretty intimate with it. You can tell them, hey, you might want to be very careful about that. Or just on your arm and chest, and literally we've heard these stories, a guy that was applying it to his arm and chest, and his um, his cat was having symptoms. He took it to the vet, and the testosterone level was really high. Well, he held his cat right here. Right? Serious. Serious. Serious fact. So, um so it is real. That's why I like scrotal delivery. Also, it's absorbed better. And um, uh, yeah, it's absorbed better also. Less with the trans. Gina has to make sure that he doesn't accidentally get it to his wife. You have to. I usually tell avoid intimacy three to four hours. Yeah. yeah. And, and the wrong person in the morning. Wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. Of course. Yeah, probably right. the biggest place that that, you know, mm -hmm. if you start out that way, it's, it's safe. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the other thing, too, is that um, it's not just one or two events. It's the every day. So the cat was in trouble because, you know, he was being held every in day time. in the time, you know. Yeah. So it was probably after he applied it. And then so apply it in the morning. After having sex, of course. <laughs> and then you can still have sex a few times during the day. Uh, what's your thoughts about the pellet um, method? Pellet, that's a great question. That's another way to deliver testosterone. Um, here, here's one of the issues with pellets. So, same um, pharmacokinetics. What's yeah, that? Same, same pharmacokinetic profile in terms of high peak. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. So right. Here's, here's what I don't like about pellets. So first of all, here's what I do like about pellets. Usually it's testosterone they give in pellets. Um, Progesterone, because of a dosing issue, you can't really dose per, uh, per pellet in, in a pellet. And I like oral progesterone anyway because it helps you sleep better than if you um, give it um, any other way. So, and estradiol should not be given in a pellet because if you do give estradiol consistently in a pellet, you will have breakthrough bleeding if you have uterus, guaranteed. So most providers that give pellets only give testosterone for that reason. So um, here's what I don't like about pellets. So pellets are... Um, they're implanted a little uh, in the um, upper butt area. They're implanted with a scalpel. Um, you can Google the procedure. Uh, I've seen it. I've witnessed it many times. You can Google the procedure online. Um, usually it's anywhere from 50 milligram to 150 milligram, one pellet placed in a woman, and it lasts anywhere from five weeks to 12 weeks. So, and once that pellet's in, it's in. So, especially the first time, if it's too much, I'm sorry, you're going to have oily skin and acne for the next three months. So you can't titrate the dose. If it's too little, they're like, well, you know what? We'll supplement with a cream until we do it next time. Okay, well, why not use a cream in the, in the beginning? Now, some people say, well, creams aren't absorbed. It's completely bunk. I just I just proved that they are. And even on women, um, we use, we like, I like to recommend vaginal testosterone. Same thing as scrotal testosterone, although it's absorbed even better in vaginal tissue because it's a mucous membrane absorbed great and it has local effects. There is not a better drug for vaginal atrophy than testosterone. Game changer, game changer. Um, that's one of the problems with pellets too. Pellets do not have a local effect on the vaginal tissue. Many women, you'll get the, their, their levels of testosterone will be way up there in pellets. They still have vaginal atrophy. They still have vaginal dryness. They still might have painful intercourse. But their testosterone, their libido is high, but their but their vaginal health is not great. So they have to go on a cream anyway. Um, you know, sometimes it's just an estrogen cream, but why not use a testosterone cream already? Easier to titrate the dose. You know, another issue with pellets. Here's the problem with pellets, especially with men. Men, you have to use multiple pellets, anywhere from you know eight to twelve of them, and pretty uh, more of a major procedure. You usually have to use one stitch. And um, there's problems with those pellets protruding out. And here's what they'll tell you with the pellets, even men or women. It's like, okay, well, you can't do any vigorous exercise for seven days. Okay, I'm a mountain bike racer. I train on my bike six days a week. That would not work. So somebody that somebody that goes to the gym four or five days a week, well, I'm sorry, you can't do squash or vigorous exercise. It wouldn't work. So, or I'll use my wife as an example. Somebody that scars really easy. If you've seen somebody that's done pellets, and I've seen a few procedures. I can see every time she had a pellet procedure. They don't. They don't use the same. They don't use the same incision. So you'll see women with scars on each cheek. 
Uh, my wife scars really easy. She wouldn't want that. And she's very active on herself. She rides her bike too, so she could use pellets. So I use both those examples. And with um, men, what I find happens too is by three months in, they're starting to get really tired. Exactly. Right. And that's it. We don't know how you're going to metabolize those pellets. So, And and they will argue, the people that, that are proponents of pellets, well, it does follow diurnal variation because when you're more active in the day, it, it, it dissolves a little bit faster. That could be some truth to that. But in general, it's, it's like this. Mm-hmm. Slowly, well, our body produces testosterone in a diurnal, daily variation, not not consistent like that. So that does that help? Yeah. Okay. There is another route of testosterone for um, men or women, and it's a buccal or sublingual testosterone. I'm not the biggest fan because, um, first of all, taste hormones don't taste great. They're they're bitter, um, so they don't taste great. We can help that a little bit with some, um, you know, stevia natural sweetener and some flavor. But still, especially in men doses, they don't taste great. And here's the problem with testosterone. It has a, it has a short half-life. Um, that's why when we give it an injection form or need the cream, with a, when it absorbs slowly, that's how the skin the skin's mechanism helps it absorb, absorb slowly. Whereas if you if you dissolve it underneath the tongue, it, it dissolves right away and absorbs right away. And there is a commercially available testosterone on the market for men, buccally, super expensive. That's why one of the reasons I don't recommend it. And you have to take it three times a day. Why would you do that? And you lose a lot of gut absorption. It's about 50%. Yeah, right. 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 So, so I'm just a big believer in cream because we, we know it works. And when somebody comes back to us, whether it be a male or female, I don't think my – males are are, are are guilty of this the most. I don't think my cream's working. Um, you know, and the, and the doctor checks the levels. Like, well, Sean, his levels back down to 200. That was lower than when you started. I'm like, well, you might want to ask him if you used it last Called me back. He hasn't used it for a week. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. He's back on the baseline. I know it works. You know, because I was just talking to a doctor yesterday in Idaho Falls. He's like, "Yeah, the cream. This guy's level is up to two thousand. I just tell him to, to, to back it off. I'm like, "Yeah." So I know I, we get we get reports like that all the time. We know if they use it, it works. What's your method of choice for estradiol? Then I like oral estradiol. I know you'll hear some that. Yeah. By mouth. By mouth. Yeah. yeah. I know you'll hear some bad things about oral estradiol and how it causes, uh, you know, clots and all that, but it's it's actually protective from cardiovascular disease risk. Um, Carl, can you make, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, just uh, yeah, the, the benefits of oral over cream is uh, far superior in terms of just like we talked about lowering cholesterol, lowering all those risks. Yeah, it gets that bad rap that oh my goodness, it must cause strokes and, or heart attacks, strokes and bleed. And you'll see some functional medicine doctors that are super, super um, into topical estrogen. And they'll say, I'll never prescribe, I'll never prescribe oral estrogen. And so you got to understand that there's, with bioidentical hormones too, there's over here and yeah. there's over here. And as, as pharmacists, we have to um, know both sides of it, you know, to be able to work with them. But I will tell you, I would err on the side of more aggressive and more conservative. A lot of functional medicine doctors are very, very conservative when it comes to estrogen well, or, or hormones in general. Well, let's fix your gut first and let's fix this, and let's fix that. Okay, they're having hot flashes. That's the first thing. Let's get them estradiol. Those hot flashes will be gone in a day. And I can almost guarantee that. I will guarantee in seven days that if you're on hot flashes, your hot flashes will be gone in a day. We, we Okay, yes, gut health and some lifestyle changes can help that. But Let's get your hot flashes gone now. Because if you are, if you're waking up at night and you're not sleeping, nothing's going to get better. Right. Sleep trumps it all. Yeah. We will dial out sleep before we dial out food. The period. only time I usually recommend a cream, especially for an estrogen, is because of atrophy, so vaginal, vaginal. use. Okay. Because I I agree with the fact that um, the brain health and the vascular health. I mean, most Americans. I mean, we always worry about the C, the C word, cancer. But most Americans die in the United States from heart disease. And if you're going to do something for that, and then also our bones. I mean, you see a woman that's, you know, you, you, you shatter a hip, it's a game changer and it's over. And that's true of men too. So what estrogen does for all those things, the oral is the far superior. Yes. Correct, yeah. Far superior. Far superior versus... So the only exception I ever go for is just a topical atrophy application. And even on that, you could do an oral estrogen and then just an estrial vaginal cream. So you could do two different prescriptions. If people are super cost conscious, we could do a vaginal estrogen, which is absorbed systemically. 
So how do we get with somebody until Linda gets through her? Program? Well, that's, that's my role. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. and, and you guys are blessed to have Linda here. And yeah. Watch. I mean, it's not. My, my staff refers to as Carl Jr., but I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's I have a little smarter. bit more hair. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. And, and she, I watched her work uh, with some of my patients in Wenatchee, and I sit there and I go, man, her details of, you know, like NAD, watching yeah. you talk about how NAD works, and I'm going, okay, I can sit there and learn quite a bit, so uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to learn yes. a lot from her. But, it goes both ways, my friends. Right. But I, so I'm here to kind of help with that. And then, you know, once she's ready to graduate, you pass that to Tom. So, and she'll learn a lot. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's so, I, I don't believe in coincidences. And, um, you know, Linda and I crossed paths, uh, on, I don't know, what was it, January or December or something. And, I mean, it's just been, it's been incredible to get to know her. And, I, I mean, Big things are going to happen at Sandpoint with Melinda. I mean, I'm not kidding. Okay. And um, Jan and I are, are, are doing everything we can to support her. Um, you know, there's really not a, a hormone specialist up in this area. And um, this is a great opportunity to just change change healthcare in Sandpoint, Idaho. You know, I mean, seriously. Um, and, and that's, you know, our goal of, of our, the pharmacy and our goal that I wrote my book and and our podcast is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. And, and that's really what we do when we talk to people about hormones. Don't, don't trust me on this. You know, go look at your own, go, go look it up yourself. And by the way, we are streaming this and it's on the Mosley Professional Pharmacy YouTube, my personal Twitter, Sean Needham, Twitter and Facebook. Um, so share it with your friends. I didn't catch any of these that you just said for the first one. What, what <laughs> Moses Lake Professional do? Pharmacy. And you can grab a card, and okay. if you use the QR code, it'll it'll come to, our, to, to the YouTube channel. John and, and I are also connected. So I'm connected on Facebook. You and I are connected on yeah. Facebook. Instagram. Yeah. Um, and I'm also connected with them on Instagram okay. as well. And so he, he does podcasts on a regular awesome. basis which he goes into great detail with a lot of different things. I mean, you guys have hundreds of podcasts. Yeah. And so, and our goal too, so when I set patients up for hormone consults and things like that with Carl, we can do it two ways. We can do it with Zoom or we can do it when he is here locally because our goal is to have Carl come at least once a month if, if that can work for his schedule so he can see patients in person. Otherwise, you know, I do a lot of that stuff and blood work and things like that so we can get you situated in Southern right. Carl. And then it's very easy. He put he gives Sean the prescriptions and then... Actually, it would probably be Janet. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Okay, so this beautiful couple gets your prescriptions <laughs> from Carl. And then it, it's mailed right to you. So, um, and and I was some, excited to get licensed in a freedom loving state. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's good. That's, that gives me yes, a picture. What, what is the average price of that? Um, like if you got on the bio, then it goes. So, from a, far, from a pharmacy standpoint, um, you can, uh, for, for, men, for women, $75 to $80 um, per three month supply. So, of, for estrogen, one of one hormone. So, of estrogen, progesterone. Um, and testosterone in general. Um, so very, very affordable. I mean, you know, the way we look at it is, uh, you know, we don't bill any insurance. One of the reasons we don't bill insurance is because it makes it affordable. Anytime you add insurance to the mix, it's, you want to get expensive, add insurance to it. Exactly. And we've had many, many a patients, they'll go to another pharmacy and they'll say, well, this, this pharmacy bills my insurance. Three months later, they're back. Cause they're like, my co-pays were more than what your price is. Yeah. We don't. We haven't raised our prices in like seven, eight years. We don't plan on that. We because hormones is what we do. So we're very efficient at it. We're very productive at it, and we want to keep the prices affordable so we can reach the masses. Um, yeah. It's so, all about it's all about wellness. I mean, that's what's so exciting about this line of work is wow. If we can get folks feeling better. They don't have to go to these systems. No, and and, and, and yeah, you, you, I mean, believe me, it, it it's rewarding for us when we have patients daily call us up and say us how, tell us how they, we've changed their life, and that is worth so much, you know. So, or I see little kids from moms that couldn't get pregnant, right? right. Like, yeah. Wow. We have a question yeah. over to her guys. Wait, uh, go ahead. Oh, so, well, yes, ma'am. You use an HSA. 
can what's that? Yes, you can. Yeah, if it's a Visa, debit card, credit card, yeah, we take them just like we would any credit card. Absolutely. And then what would it be to see Carl and kind of get set up? Right. So a hormone, a bit of that. A hormone consult costs two hundred and fifty at at seven VIP to see Carl. And and um, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, Linda. Um, you'll need some labs. Yes. Um, so that, I'm not sure of the cost of the labs. So so I I'm going to give you an example. This is just how insurance. I believe in. You know, you get a copy of my book later, but I believe insurance is a complete ripoff, complete scale. I mean, my wife do not have, and I do not have typical insurance. Unfortunately, we, we probably never will, except when our communist government makes us get Medicare, and then we'll still find some way to get around it. But we have a health sharing ministry. It's a wonderful way. You get to decide where you go based on price, based on service. It, it's it's awesome. We love it. And we, we've had two pretty major issues with both of our kids um, you know, me and boys doing boy stuff, breaking a wrist, breaking a bone, and it worked wonderfully. So, um, but for routine care, I, I, you know, I, that's not what health insurance was meant for, but that's what we've used it for. And that's why it's gotten so expensive. Um, but on la a lab example, so we, we, you know, we work with a lot of these providers like Carl and patients will come in and I'll let Carl kind of, kind of go with this. And they'll come in and they'll say, well, I don't use my insurance. And Carl will say, well, if you get your labs here, it's going to be a hundred bucks. Oh, for everything, it's going to be two hundred and fifty. If I do, yeah. I mean, I'm doing homocysteine. I'm doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm doing a whole nine yards. So those same labs in the hospital would be two thousand dollars. Two thousand. Right. 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 So, but some patients will come in and they'll say, "Well, I want to bill my insurance." Okay. So just to let you know, if we bill your insurance and it's not covered, you're going to be out two thousand dollars. Most of the time, they come back and they say, "Well, it was covered." But my co pays twelve hundred bucks. Yeah, that's why we don't bill insurance. It's a complete scam, complete ripoff. Insurance was meant to. What's that? They won't do all the labs. No, no. They, they don't, well, vitamin D is not covered, or homocysteine is not covered, or okay, yeah, insulin is not covered. You're not a diabetic. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. And at, at, at seventy, I think oh. we're not. We don't take insurance either. Right. So we're actually working with a, another lab option. Um, that works with other clinics that don't do insurance to make it a lot cheaper because they understand that patients aren't doing, you know, doing it. And, and that's a wonderful thing. We call it free market medicine. Mm -hmm. Over the last, Jen and I haven't built insurance in our pharmacy for over 20 years because we saw the scam 20 plus years ago. And um, we were called crazy. Um, and in reality, we were kind of pioneers in the market. And now there's a lot of people like Carl and surgery centers from all over the country now that don't bill insurance. And they know it because they don't do it because they know it rips off the patient. Um, quality goes down, service goes down, and price goes up. Yeah. So the, the paradigm is shifting. Yeah, it's it is. It's, it's cool to see. I love it. I mean, as I travel all over the nation, I'm like, oh, wow, another provider that is getting out of insurance business. I love it. You know, because they, they they see the scam. So, um, healthcare. Don't let don't let the media or the government make you believe healthcare is ex expensive. It's not. If you pay cash and you shop for it like you do any other service, healthcare is very very affordable. And remember, the best insurance we have is right here. It's not some policy that we buy. Don't let insurance company dictate your health ever. Question? I hear hand up. Saw hand up. No. Yes, ma'am. I just had a question on. My understanding was when you start to take hormones, your body's no longer going to produce those hormones. So if you're kind of borderline, well, I can go another couple of years. It's not a big deal. Should you hold off, or does it depend on how much you're prescribed? If you prescribe a low level to kind of help offset, and how's that work? I, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, here, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to I'm going to give an example for men. Okay, so 45 year old man comes in. Um, he's got erectile dysfunction. He's got um, decreased libido, weight gain in the middle, high cholesterol, um, decreased energy, um, decreased lean body mass, um, all that stuff. Um, and um, he's worried about well, once I go on testosterone, is it going to decrease my endogenous um, production of testosterone? Yes, it will. Okay, so. If you want to live with your erectile dysfunction, you want to live with your high cholesterol, you want to live with your um, decreased lean body mass, your depression for the next two years before we start you on it, that's fine. Um, but you're going that way anyway. So now, if it's a 25-year-old, that's a whole different story. And it's a whole different method of treatment. And it's a whole different conversation, especially if they're having kids and stuff like that. But um, that's that's my question. Same, same thing with women. 
it's like, okay, well, you're having irregular cycles and you know, you're having these hormone type issues and you're 45 years old. It, your, your, your ovaries, no matter what we do functionally with functional medicine, yes, we can help some of that stuff with diet and lifestyle, but your ovaries are on, on their way there. Eventually they're going to quit producing hormones. So you got to decide when, you know, and not only that, it's not just, it's not just those symptoms that you're worried about too, but long-term benefits. The, the sooner you start hormones, the, the faster your bones get better, the faster your heart gets better, decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, it's really going out 20, 30 years right. in terms of prevention and wellness. Yeah. So, you know, you could wait, but then you're delaying kind of that, that yes. further benefit down So the when I counsel people about their hormones in a situation like that, the first thing I want to know is how's the sleep happening? Mm-hmm. How are you sleeping? Because if my clients aren't sleeping, I know they're not healing. Right? Because when we sleep, that's when our body's repairing. And if you aren't repairing, like Carl said, that disease stuff, that stuff that's happening in your body, is, is, it's happening, and we don't even see it until 20 years, 30 years down the line. And the lack of sleep is paradigm to everything that we're talking about. It is number one. Because if you have inflammation and your body's not repairing, those bad cells aren't being replaced. <laughs> that vessel in, in your coronary artery is not being regenerated and replaced. Your brain isn't functioning well. You know, so so for me, when I counsel someone, if you're not sleeping, we're going to deal with the sleep because right. that's first. We haven't even talked about the hormone melatonin. No, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know, but we could be here for a while. <laughs> yeah, we could be here for a long time. I'm 59. I take yes. about 50 milligrams of melatonin per night, but I know that. Melatonin peaks about age twelve, and then yep. it just steadily declines. By the time you get my age, it's flat. It's so your, your teenagers that aren't sleeping well, melatonin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when they when they wake, wake up groggy, yeah. give them a little bit of a break. Okay, yeah. it was yeah. tough for my it was tough for me with my kids, but I did. It's like I knew the melatonin thing, so it's like yeah, I get it. You're groggy in the morning, but you still shouldn't act like that. <laughs> um, how much melatonin are we talking for? For kids, yeah. teenagers, how much would you do? I well, I, I mean, here's what I tell patients. Start with three milligrams. Yeah, one milligram is, I mean, even though we have a one milligram capsule, I, yeah, three I milligrams is the most popular. Mm-hmm. And I, I say double the dose until you get vivid dreams. Um, melatonin is very safe. I've taken mm-hmm. up to 200 milligrams. I don't take it regularly, but I've taken up to 200 milligrams of melatonin. Um, you know, um, 50 milligrams is a pretty good dose. But melatonin, you know, and it doesn't always work. You know, sometimes if you get up to so many it doesn't work. Right. Yeah, right. there's so many variabilities with that. Um, but yeah, melatonin is very, okay. very important. I have a question on melatonin. Yeah. I, it's like through the natural community, you hear that like, especially before 9 a.m., the more sunlight you get, it's kind of setting your melatonin levels for the night. Is that true, or is that just one of those like... I, you know, I, 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 we're... Yeah, there's. I mean, there's a there's a great book out there, the Mel, Melatonin Melatonin um, Miracle, that was actually at that last conference that they spoke about that. But there is some truth to that. Okay, Getting so that light. Yeah, you're yeah, welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. So, okay. Any other questions? Because I know we. Well, speaking of melatonin, I've I've known of a friend who put her young child on melatonin, and I mean, I know not everyone's created equal, right? Mm-hmm. So, is it true that like if you have more side effects and issues? Um, as a child got older, is that like because they're not all created alike? You don't just buy something over the counter, or I, I, when it comes to sleep. I mean, yeah, that's a tough one. There, there's so many things, you know, like she was talking about sunlight and stuff. I mean, you know, we, we, we are diurnal creatures and, and, and hats, my hats go off to people that work at night, but we're not meant to work at night. We're not meant to work shift work. We're meant to work during the day and sleep at night. So the more we can follow the sun, the, the better. And that's why, you know, seeing the sun in the morning to wake us up and the natural sunlight, you know, um, and, and, you know, in the um, evening, seeing sunset. So those things are important. Uh, you know, because that's what's going to really stimulate our melatonin in a diurnal pattern is sunlight. Now, it gets tougher up here in the northern latitudes because it gets, you know, dark so early and stuff. And there's some lights that you can buy and stuff to stimulate uh, stimulate sun, sunlight. But, but general rule with pediatrics, I'm, I'm not doing melatonin just because I know it's still producing. Um, so that's that's a more specialized question. I'm not comfortable yeah. with it. Do you like the transdermal, the melatonin creams at all? Or would you rather have the... I do oral. oral. I do oral. Or there's yeah. actually suppositories out there for the actually best. Yeah. yeah. Or melatonin works pretty <laughs> orally. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Yes, ma'am. What brand of melatonin are you talking about getting it from you or getting it over the counter at the drugstore? Well, I, there, there's lots of good brands out there. Okay. Um, there are some. There is truth to you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in sustained release melatonin. That's the kind we normally um, uh, get a recommend. Um, stay, slow release, sustained release, because you take it and it lasts all night long. Whereas, you know, a non sustained release, you're going to take it and you get absorption and then it's gone. That's not how our body produces to, produces melatonin. So, I'm a big believer in sustained release. And yeah, we do we do stock melatonin. We can ship, we can ship it all over. Also, I generally tell folks buy clothes at Costco, but don't buy your vitamins. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's a good idea. <laughs> All right, well, I thank you guys so much yes. for coming out. Please um, grab a card on your way out. Uh, lots of videos that you can educate yourself on. You'll also be able to find this video in a live stream. Um, but we'll also uh, edit it and share it across all of our podcast forums. Um, and we're going to hang around for a few minutes, too, if you have any, any more personal questions. So thank you so much yeah. for, for having us.